Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, how many of you recognise, well, not the person, but where that is? In, no, it's in Stanford, just uh, above or below Cape Town. Um, I came here in 2012 on my African Dream, which was a dream fellowship that was funded uh, by the UK to, uh, to be different, to learn, uh, learn something and to try and think differently about creativity. So I was very fortunate to be invited to University of Cape Town uh, by sadly the late uh, Gary Marsden. And he was determined to give me uh, a, an African dream. And so part of this was to try out many different experiences. And one of them was this sand surfing. I have a book, if any of you are interested, um, which is the output of that fellowship, which is all about creativity. When I give it to people in the UK, they think I'm uh, you know, mad because they think it's um, they think it's snow, not sand. They don't understand that in South Africa you don't really have snow. Anyway, so I have spent several months in in Cape Town, and I learned a lot um, about um, creativity. But I didn't really learn much about UX um, because I was at the university there. And the last two days have been really an eye opener for me about what a wonderful community you are and you know how much you've moved in terms of uh, bringing UX to products to services and, and really thinking about um, you know, the way forward and so um, it's always a great pleasure because I'm an academic I'm you know a prof who tries to instill in my students um, the importance of design about users and so on and see you actually practicing it's been wonderful so um, we've learned a lot um, I'm not going to go through uh, all of these, you know them off by heart, but we've been developing uh, methods and uh, frameworks and um, approaches for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, usability it was to begin with, and now we've been doing UX for the last 10 years. Um, but what's happening, and many of you uh, might be aware, is that there's um, a, a push within technology towards automating services and, and um, particularly um, thinking about how we can make things more efficient um, and optimizing them. And that often means forgetting about the user, because we know users, people are unreliable. So there's been a push to do a U-turn almost from thinking about the user experience and usability towards let's design systems to be super efficient. And that means trying to get the human out of the loop. And this is called the Internet of Things. And it's round the corner and every large corporation is very excited by this new technology and essentially it's where you network a whole set of devices with smartphones and sensors and actuators and think of how we might do this and what many of these corporations are doing is making visionary videos and I just want to show you one which came out a few weeks ago by Hoover all of you know Hoover that wonderful vacuum cleaning company they've moved into the kitchen Anyway, um, 
there are lots of these videos just coming out, thinking about how to improve the white good experience, the kitchen. And um, it's, I think, um, industry is driving this vision of IoT. Um, and as I said, the goal is very much towards improving efficiency, um, energy safety, and saving. And the aim is to automate and to take the human out of the loop, to have intelligent and smart technology. So there's no need for human intervention or control. And importantly, that means there's no need for usability or UX because it's all being automated. And I want us to kind of think about, as a community, is this a good thing, uh, ever more automation? And stepping back 15 years or so, um, where automation um, for everyday living started was the ubiquity of sensors. These are um, a selection, there are hundreds or thousands of them available. These are available in China, and you see them everywhere now, these sensor uh, boxes. Um, and um, what they do is they make our lives simpler, more efficient, and they prevent things from happening. So here, there's one actually as you come into this building, you're not quite sure if you go in there, those doors will open and allow you through, because they're stationary, and that's to save energy. Um, it's also our, our lights come on now through sensors, our heating, our toilets, and so on. This is one of my favorites. It was taken in uh, Indianapolis Airport, uh, which is uh, automatic faucets to turn on, walk up to sink, to turn off, walk away from sink, so you never have to do anything like this. And then at the bottom it says, black clothing does not operate faucets. So you are screwed if you're wearing black. You're just going to have unhygienic hands because sensor technology can't detect. Unless you start going like this or ask someone to come along. Um, but it's becoming, um, as we saw in the video, it's not just our taps, our toilets and our lights, but sensors are being put everywhere in the environment. Our factories, our buildings, our roads, our cities, our home and our clothing. And the whole thing is that let's get the computer to do the work. You don't need to turn the light on. You don't need to uh, check anything because the technology will do it. And one of the motivators besides it being more efficient is to prevent accidents. So if you happen to leave the faucet on, sometimes that might, you know, if you're filling up the bath, it might overflow. And in hotels, that can be very costly. So if you have these that automatically switch off, you prevent flooding. So there are good reasons. Um, for having sensing technology. And I'm not saying it's all bad. I think having sensors in our environment can be very good for certain types of activities and tasks. And this is one where I think it's very good, is um, for um, bridges that can communicate when they're starting to creak or there's a crack, um, especially when um, they're difficult places to see for engineers. So um, putting these up there will and detect early on before it's too late, before the bridge crashes down, um, that this needs some repair. The same with um, traffic. Uh, um, more and more, the GPS um, uh, is being used in, in people's cars, along with their smartphones, to determine the speed the cars are going. And then, um, with this, it's determined that to reduce the speed to uh, having what's called variable speeds. And it works very well in, in London on the M25, when you get people to go from 70 miles an hour down to 40. And that stops the, the traffic jams, because you know what causes a traffic jam. Someone suddenly goes into another lane and breaks, and that has this domino effect that goes on, and very quickly you get those traffic jams. Whereas here, using people's smartphones, you can kind of control the traffic. This one's a bit more controversial, which is in factories, there's an introducing wearable vest devices, as well as um, smart uh, watches, um, not very aesthetically beautiful like the ones we heard earlier today, but here the idea is this, that people can walk around um, the factory floor and collect data that can then be automatically analysed. Um, and if there's the temperature's not quite right or if there's some high level of something, it can be automatically um, uh, adjusted without human beings having to go around sensing. So you are in effectively becoming a walking sensor. But perhaps the ultimate... Uh, is the driverless car, which you saw um, earlier today, where this is Google's uh, dream, where you have no steering wheel um, and no gas pedal, no brake pedal, and you don't ha ever have to drive because it will drive for you. 
anyone seen one of these cars in going around or have read about it? In, um, the, they've had a number of accidents in California. The problem is that they're very slow. It's like you have a what we call in the UK Sunday afternoon drivers. They're really hesitant before they take off. And if you're behind it and you see that you know, there's nothing coming and, it, and it's gone from red to green, you start to kind of you know get ready to move. But with these um, driverless cars, they um, take another few seconds and then you get the person behind hits in them. It's very frustrating having very cautious drivers and it's no doubt going to cause road rage. One of the problems with this is they haven't taken into account the driver experience. People love driving. They love to be in control of that wheel. It's all about efficiency. Let's try and safety. Let's try and prevent rather than, you know, people actually enjoy driving. So, given that we're going towards ever more automation, what will people do? Will they go on their bike and just spend the whole time getting notifications <laughs> and enjoy that? Um, we will spend our whole time getting notifications and monitoring. And for every new um, service that's provided, there's an app that it's very proud to tell you. It's taking over these boring jobs um, and it's doing it well. So, um, we saw the cooker. This is another one that all of the big companies are moving towards, is the washing machine and, and the tumbler dryer. And there's an app that will tell you what it's doing. So here it's saying, dry is complete, please check your laundry. And it's, so you, you know, it's, it's very proud that it's finished. But not only that, it'll tell you everything you ever needed or wanted to know about your washing machine. How many bulky items are in there? What's, you know, what's the weight? How many more minutes it's going to take? And so forth. So it's like trying to get us more obsessive about our white goods, worrying about them. Are they, are they working OK? Um, and so that's kind of been a trend, is towards giving us this sort of information that we don't perhaps necessarily need. Any of you seen one of these, Mother Sense? This product came out about a year ago. It was one of the very first commercial uh, Internet of Things um, systems designed for the home. And the idea is you have this hub that sits somewhere in the home, and then these are four what they call cookies, but they're sensors that you can, uh, you can stick to um, a pillbox, you can stick to your keys, or you can stick to um, a toothbrush. The reason why you might stick it to a toothbrush is it has an, they have accelerometers and, tem and temperature sensors in them. So it can measure whether you're cleaning your teeth. This one can uh, detect whether you know, you, you've lost your keys, and this one is whether grandma is taking her, um, all of her pills. At the, it becomes a smart pill box, because it can work out whether it's been picked up. And then you'll have these apps, um, which is you can monitor who's cleaning their teeth the most. Um, is it dad, <laughs> mum, or This system, when it came out, cost $300, and you only get four of these smart cookies. But if you really want to know, you can add, put one here on your Nespresso machine, and it will um, measure when the capsule goes down, and then it will give you this nice visualization saying how much coffee you've drunk um, per day. Um, not who's drunk it necessarily, but how much coffee has been drunk. We all really want to know that, don't we? So, um, what else might humans do in this world that's going to become ever increasing automated? And I think one of the interesting things is, is how do we get this set up if we're going to move into this world? How does the user become involved? And there's been a push towards um, uh, users being involved in writing the rules for these things to happen. And so, if there's only half a carton of mil milk in the fridge, then add milk to the supermarket shopping list app. If it goes above 85 degrees, then switch on the aircon. So we can be involved quite simply with these, these ways of setting up the rules. And this approach is called, if this, then do that. If I arrive at my home, then open my garage door, and all you as a user have to do is specify your home address and the name of the garage door that should open when you arrive home. Really easy, and it's kind of thinking about how the user might have some control over all of these things that might happen. <coughs> And this is the sort of scenario that's often presented about involving the user, creating these rules, and this is what they might do. You'll be able to close your garage door with your smartphone, check how many times your kids open the fridge, 
what they took out, and you'll be able to chart it. In turn, your fridge and your pantry will put your grocery list together, transmit it to your smartphone while you're shopping, or directly to the um, company that delivers your groceries. You don't ever read a nightmare scenario about the Internet of Things. <laughs> Here's the nightmare scenario. Your garage door does not stop opening and closing after you've parked the car. You look at your smartphone, but it does not suggest what to do. You expect it to fix it, but it doesn't. You try to find a way of undoing the garage door rule, but it does not tell you how to. As you are checking on a forum seeking advice, a message comes up telling you that 100 litres of milk have been ordered and arrive at your house in 10 minutes. Who ordered that amount? Who do you call to stop them arriving? You walk into the house and see foam all over the kitchen floor pouring out of the washing machine. Who do you call to fix it? Um, and um, you call a, a, a line, but it puts you on hold, a helpline, and so on and so forth. No one really thinks about these things that may happen. What do you, what, how do you undo them? It's going to be much harder when everything is connected. So the Internet of Things so far is all about objects. And here, if, you, if you do a Google uh, search for images, this is the kind of thing that comes up. Can you see a single user or a person there? It's all, as the name suggests, it's the Internet of Things. And um, I'm arguing, and part of my team have been trying to think about the Internet of People. How might we involve or put a user in this besides doing the notification and um, maybe writing a few rules. How might we rethink that? And so I want you to uh, think about, as we become more and more um, Internet of Things, how do we um, engage uh, from the user's perspective? And that we can start to design more active user interfaces and we can enable um, interaction uh, for Internet of Things so that there are more tools for user engagement and that there's more human-centered data information that people can trust, that they can feel control of, and that they can act upon. And as a researcher, I have the, the pleasure or the torment, depending which way you want to look, in devising my own studies and prototypes to explore this area. And I'm going to mention three case studies which my team have been working on. I should say that in my team I have about three or four postdocs. One is an interaction designer who's very much into physical design. One is a software engineer who really understands how you do engineering uh, for the Internet of Things. And another is a user studies person. And then a few PhD students. <coughs> so we've been looking at how we can empower people in the home so that they don't just get notifications, but um, they um, can decide themselves what they're interested in finding out more about and have control over it. The current push, I don't know about here in South Africa, but certainly in the US and Europe, is towards smart metering. Is there any way we can get rid of that UX South Africa conference? No? OK. Um, anyway, so this is the kind of thing you see. It's a visualization for smart metering of your energy at home, electricity or gas is how much it would cost per hour at that point, how much you've spent today, and how much is the daily budget. And this has been rolled out in, as I said, Europe and in the US. And a lot of people feel that they're not in control of this. This has just been imposed on them. And so when it comes into the home, they might look at it for a couple of weeks, and then they discard it. Um, and it can often go into the cupboard. So people aren't using their smart meters in the way in which governments have hoped. Um, and there's very, the idea was that you would start to change your behavior and use less energy. There's very a low reported energy savings from those who've actually had these, and there have been very few studies, perhaps up to 2 to 4%. Some studies have actually reported increased amount of energy um, having had these put into the home. And what people have done to make that change is to set their washing machines and dishwashers to come on into the night. But they don't need to have this expensive technology. So our research is to try and think how we might give people um, the ability to understand more about their home um, and the things that you can sense. And we've developed a kit called Fizzy Kit. <coughs> and this Fizzy Kit um, provides, this is the team down here, a physical, tangible um, set of cubes that change their behavior depending on which uh, Thing they're mapped to. 
So there are um, a number of these cubes, and you can map them to environmentally sense data. It could be noise, it could be light, it could be humidity, it could be temperature. The point is that we don't decide. We um, ask our families in their homes to decide how they might use these cubes. We have here a tablet which um, allows them to easily touch um, what the things that are being sensed um, with the different things that happen in the cubes. So the first component is um, what's called Smart Citizen. This is a product that was developed um, as an open source sensing um, device that senses um, a range of things from NO2 to um, CO2, light temperature. And this is meant for the domestic urban market. One of my PhD students was involved in devising this a few years ago at Barcelona at one of their um, smart fab labs. And you, put these, you can put this in your home and it will measure. And then this data becomes available to anyone to access via a typical dashboard data board. So you can see here at this particular point, um, this person here, what the light reading is, what the temperature is, and so on. And what we found is when people look at this data, they don't understand it. They can't think, well, what, what does this mean in the context of my own home? And so that's where we <coughs> thought PhysiKid could come along and help them to start to uh, make sense more of that data. So as I said, PhysiKids, these are prototypes we built. This one will change, it has a series, a matrix of LEDs, and these will, you can create patterns, different colors, um, depending on what's being measured. So if it's noise level and it gets to a certain level, it might change to be all red. If You can also measure relative to someone else. So if you are interested in how you compare with your neighbor, um, you can show your neighbor's noise level as well. This one here is, um, if you can see on the top there, there's a disc and it just moves and it can go clockwise, anti-clockwise, and it can go slow or fast. And you can put a pot plant or anything on there. Again, you can map this to humidity levels or noise levels through using this simple um, touch interface where you just map uh, the temperature with uh, one of these cubes. And then you can set a rule which will say, um, set this to come on if the, the uh, temperature, the, sorry, the, the CO2 level is one of these, and it's been set for exhaled breath. It could also be, it's like being inside a chimney, or it's like a smoker exhaling. And so we try to give the language um, that people are familiar with when they set these rules. So we gave five families a set of these cubes, and the first thing that um, these families did, the kids said, I want the red one, the, uh, or the blue one. But then they started to explore how they would put them into the home and what to match. And what we found was that they were really creative in thinking about mapping the different ways in which you could sense things like light, air, movement, with um, <coughs> temperature, noise, or humidity. And um, one example of this was where a mum was very keen to point out to her children that they were very noisy. And so she set it up that when they reached a certain decibel level, um, the, the fizzy light would come on and show a, a pattern of light. What happened though was much to her horror <laughs> that it, she, it showed that she was noisier than the kids. <laughs> and the kids got very empowered by this. So um, we're currently, um, this is part, we've done an initial study, we've got a huge amount of interest in this kind of way of making something tangible that you are alerted, and they put this in, you know, on the TV in the kitchen to go and have a look at the data. It's not meant to be replacing the data. It's meant to give you a way of thinking about what does that squiggly line mean, and then they can think, oh yes, that's when that happens. So it's a way of adding to the sense making by using something that's physical or tangible. And so we're going to um, run another study soon with a hundred families um, in uh, Portugal and the UK to see, you know, whether we can get over the novelty factor that it does sustain interest and people start to get, you know, think about data. We've done it with environmental data, but there's no reason why it can't be health data or it could be things that are happening on digitally. So it could be what's happening on Twitter. So you can use any data to map using this. We just used environmental. Okay, the second um, example, some of the research we've done 
thinking about uh, engaging users more is called Voxbox. And this, as you can see here, is a very physical um, device to try and get people to answer questions. And we wanted to get away from digital or paper-based way of trying to get feedback. Those of you who are involved in, in trying to um, get people to elicit feedback will know how painful it can be sometimes to get people to answer these surveys. Presumably after this conference, we'll all be asked to fill in a survey and it will come into your inbox and I'm sure not many of you will have the time or the inclination to complete it. And so that was partly um, our motivation, was to think, how can we get more people, more diverse set of people, to um, provide feedback? And the feedback can be for events, or it can be museums where they've got new exhibitions, or it could be hotels, a whole range of places where people need and want feedback. And my design was very much um, inspired by old retro design, physical knobs and dials. And so um, instead of having a, you know, a, a Likert scale where you just put a cross, the idea was that you could actually feel um, where you wanted to answer it. And so there were sliders and knobs and dials that were used. But we also, instead of having, getting for an open-ended question, people having to write, we had an old-fashioned handset that rang and that they could answer by talking into that. Another innovation that we had was to provide um, feedback immediately of what everyone else had said. And so we were able to get simple visualizations uh, of how many uh, for the demographics and, and various other questions that were being asked. Um, uh, and so people could see in the moment what, what the answers were. Now, why is this Internet of Things? Um, it is because uh, we're using this, the, the data that's been collected um, and it's going, to, it's communicating with a back-end server using Node.js and then up in the cloud, and then the data is aggregated and come, comes back to those real-time visualizations. So what we did was, um, last summer, we were invited to uh, put this in the Tour de France in London in two places, one in uh, a busy park and another in Canary Wharf, and to see what happened. And we designed it so that we wouldn't go up to someone and say, would you like to come and try our thing? We just stood back as researchers and wanted to see um, what happened. So I'm going to show you a little video of it in use. <coughs> So traditional questionnaires on paper, people don't like to be stopped in the street and asked their opinions necessarily. Um, web questionnaires after an event don't tend to capture people's feelings in the moment and also get quite low responses. And so we wanted to design something that would uh, engage people and make them want to give their feedback. 
you can see a visualization of what people have said so far. Um, so whether they're having fun or they feel safe. And you can also see um, quotes that come from the, the phone um, for the, the open questions that we asked. So what people have said into that. device that uh, captures audience opinions in a, in a more engaging way. Uh, so what we try to do with the Vox Box is um, we try to come up with a system with which people have a sort of engaging sort of time machine kind of, kind of thing and um, what inspired us to, to design it this way is this computer game I used to play as a kid which was called The Incredible Machine and it was amazing because you just have to go through with all these levers and these buttons and you have to complete a circuit, and uh, that's kind of what it's based on. So we have the balls dropping through, and at the same, ta the same time we're getting people's opinions. I think we need to start like looking at how people have been using it, um, and thinking about how we might be able to use it for more events. So we did. We um, found for this particular event that people were queuing to come and use it which is quite a rare thing. We also got groups of people. So here we've got uh, families participating. <laughs> we've got people uh, um, in wheelchairs, on bikes, a whole range of people you wouldn't normally necessarily ask or expect to give a response. And here's one of my favorite dad with his five young kids, all waiting patiently to have a go to respond. Um, so what we found from, from running it there was that um, we've got what we call the, hun the honeypot effect. When there's one person trying it or two, um, it, it draws people in. And also very much the design, as you heard from the designer, is that it was a playful, colorful, um, uh, retro design that was very attractive. And that um, people felt very comfortable. They understood immediately how to use this. They weren't sort of thinking, oh, do I swipe here, do I press here? They knew intuitively how to use it. And people ask us, well, did they take it seriously? And it was a bit like when you go to an ATM, you stand there and you're in a zone, and step back and watch you as they're you know, answering questions and they do take it very seriously and we're very interested in the, um, the feedback that we were able to give them. Since then we've, had, we've been inundated with companies uh, wanting one um, and we're currently talking about developing a, a whole range of these uh, for putting in the US in the Exploratorium Science Museum, the London Science Museum because they find it really hard to get feedback moment about new exhibits but there are a whole range of possibilities and I think the lesson for us is that it may appear to be quite expensive it wasn't that expensive to make but physicality and tangibility can really be striking and attractive and draw people and I think that's the lesson there is how might we bring physicality and tangibility back into uh, UX design because we've gone increasingly towards the smartphone and, and the tablet and being very much digital whereas I think do quite a lot bringing the physical back. So finally I just want to talk about a current project that we're working on which is very much uh, how do we put the uh, Internet of Things into urban environments. I've talked about domestic and this is a project that um, uh, we're doing with um, our great rival University Imperial. We're working together but also we're working with what's called the London Legacy Development <coughs> Corporation and the Future Cities Catapult. And when, when the Olympics came to London in 2012, um, a vast amount of money was spent on them, as was here with the World Cup. And what governments and, have, and councils have to then do is prove that there is a legacy, that it isn't they've invested in all this money and then nothing happens. And so what's happening here with this one is it's going through a transformation. Lots of buildings are going on in the park, and they're very interested in how they might put sensors um, into the environment, into the park, to be able to detect and measure certain things about the people going there. And we've been asked to come along 
as the user experience team to try and think about um, what the visitors do there and how might we engage them more and how might we get them to come back and visit. But I want to just, before I move into how we might do that, learn from um, the design of robotic interfaces and how that's um, influencing um, some of our thinking. How many of you have got a Roomba or seen them in action or know someone who's got one? A few of you. There's been a lot of research um, and into the design of the interface for domestic robots, thinking about how to make them friendly, how to make them so that people trust them, but also how they can anthropomorphize them. And here are some domestic robots for hospitals uh, which can deliver um, medicines. And just something very simple by putting on a smiley face makes it much more friendly and trustworthy. And you see that also in factories where you get these kind of funky, playful uh, types of robots. This one is for moving uh, heavy plants around um, in a logistics um, 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 factory. And just by thinking a little bit about the design and, and colorfulness of it can go a long way. Now look at how sensor box is being developed. What do you notice? There's very little color. They are very plain. No one's really thought about the, the design of them other than they should be functional because they've been designed to be hidden to be and rather bland and to be placed to measure things about the environment. So this one's on a lamppost. Um, and um, what happens is people get very suspicious when they see things like that, what's being measured um, and why. And so our idea is let's learn from robotic interface design and think about how we can, if we're going to sense things of, um, about the environment, how can we get them so that people embrace them, they trust them and they understand why that data has been collected. We ran a workshop a couple, uh, a couple of years ago in Zurich to try and think about how the form factor will influence what people do when they see um, something that's been sensed. This is a toolkit we developed. It's got a smartphone, LED screen, and various sensors and other actuators there. And we got groups um, at the workshop to think about how they might use this to measure something about Zurich. We also talked about the importance of how you might what you put it in, how you house it. So we gave them a box, there were three groups, and they had to think about what they were going to measure in, in Zurich. And one group was very interested in, in um, how the buses, um, how comfortable um, a bus ride was, and whether if there were potholes, could you measure that, and how that affected the, the uh, experience. So they spent a lot of time thinking about how to use the vibrator, um, actuator, and how to sense that. They just put it into a box, and they left it like that as their plain box. Another group was interested in, in changing the form factor and seeing how people might approach it. So they dressed it up as a duck. And the third group dressed it up as an alien. So the three groups went out into the city. And what do you think happened? Well, the group that went on, they took it on the bus and they immediately got negative responses. Um, people were very suspicious about what, why they were holding this yellow box um, and whether they were spying. And the bus driver asked them to leave the bus because it was putting off the, the other customers. With the duck, passers-by shook its leg. They just thought it was a very friendly thing. And then with the alien, passers-by got really excited by it and took lots of selfies. And what this this one did was, I don't know if you can read this, but it said, shake my hand and I'll take a photo of you. They didn't know where the photo was going, but everyone thought it was very friendly and they shook its hand and had their photo taken. And then it's the inevitable, um, taking lots of selfies, and there it is um, there. So I think it's a lesson to be learned about really thinking about the form factor if we're going to put sensors into the environment and to en enable people to know a bit more about what's being sensed, but also that it's approachable it's been designed to collect certain um, information. And that's where our project comes in. We just started. It's called Project Romeo. And uh, what we're going to do is devise, it's not going to look like that, that's just an initial thing. Um, these, these devices called Romeo with inputs and outputs. And we're very interested in collecting data. And it will be, these will be, um, have some kind of robotic um, base to them so they can move around and they will be moving around in this park. This is the, the leftovers from the, um, the Olympic Park in London. And so there will be, you know, people can go and approach them 
and give information and find out things about the park. And so each Romeo is going to have onboard sensors, physical knobs and dials asking visitors for their input, visualizations, maybe speech input, um, to enable them to uh, find out things and also feel comfortable giving information about what they're doing and, um, and other things that we're, we're very interested in. But they'd also be able to communicate with, with the other Romeos and other sensors in the park. So giving the human face, if you like, to sensor collecting. And um, we'll also have central display where some of the data that's been collected um, will be people will be able to find out more about the park, where the vibe is, for example, how many people have engaged in, in, in the, uh, with the Romeos, um, and um, what kinds of data intrigues people. So I think we're at that stage now by <coughs> thinking if, yeah, this is, raises lots of UX questions, particularly if, you know, about the public. How do you attract the public to engage with sense data of the different kinds that lead to increased visits, engagements, and enjoyment? And I think for us is how do the public make sense or do sense making in situ? And how does interpreting in public lead to more reflection and action, and most importantly, do they trust the data? So we're at the current stage now of building our first prototype, which we'll have ready before Christmas. Um, and then we, our plan is to get a few of these roaming around in the park by Easter. Um, so if any of you are over in London um, at Easter, and you want to see Romeo in action, or your family of Romeos, um, please drop by. So I just hopefully, some of you might ask, what's that got to do with um, you know, UX from a practitioner's perspective. But I hope I've given you some insights into the kind of research we do where we're trying to bring the user experience into um, the Internet of Things, which has increasingly become about automation and not thinking too much about what humans will do. So my takeaway message is, yes, it's okay if, as we develop these services to take the human out of the loop when you are optimizing appliances, factories, bridges, and so on, um, where it makes sense um, because it's tedious or it does improve safety. But I really think we need to think about how to keep the human in the loop for new experiences, for discovering things about the environment and the home, uh, for sharing information, uh, for getting people to trust that we're having more and more of these sensors around, and also for them to be able to create and to reflect on data. And we've heard a number of talks about you know, human-centered data, but we need to think about how we can allow people to do that. Just giving them dashboards doesn't work. It might be okay for a few people, a few experts, but most people it just glazes over. And so with the Fizzy Kit, I hope we've shown you how we can make it more engaging and exciting for them to think about the data they're interested in rather than us saying what you might be interested in. And the same with Romeo. So thank you very much for listening and also to all my colleagues who've helped me with this. And if you are um, in London at all and want to drop into the lab and see the kinds of um, prototypes we've built, you're more than welcome to drop me a line. Thank you.